My guest today is X Zane Anderson, who is a husband, father, speaker, and author. He's been featured on Forbes.com, Speaker Magazine, TV, and various blogs and podcasts. As an eight-year-old boy, he watched his mother die. From this experience, he learned just how powerful a parent's influence really is. In today's episode, we talk about his book, What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. X Zane knows that what you do in your family can last longer and have far more influence than anything else you do. Welcome to Lifeology. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. I am really looking forward to this. You and I have had a, lots of talks in the pre-calls, so I'm really looking forward to hearing all your wisdom. I know you went through a lot when you were a child, and I know it's, it's helped you and impacted you in so many ways, not only with, with your children, but also in writing this book as well. So once again, great, great content that we're going to talk about today. I want to jump right into it. So at eight years old, what happened for you at that time but was with your mother? Yeah, well, just briefly, you know, uh, I watched my mom die when I was eight years yeah. old, and it, from that experience, you know, I, I realized there were things that she did that were very, very uh, short. They were they were not a big deal that you wouldn't you wouldn't think they were a big deal yeah. to still have a profound effect on me today and, and on my children. So I'm kind of in this unique situation because I know you know things that she did when I was five and six uh -huh. that after she died, and you know, I'm 45 years old now, that still profoundly affect me. They're affecting my children. Wow. And so it kind of puts me in that unique situation. Yeah. You know, I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, I, I can't imagine how that is to have your, your parent pass away at any time, was, you know, especially at eight years old. I mean, that was incredibly difficult. You know, I, I remember, we, we had talked about this before. I remember you were influenced by some of your peers when it comes to your drawing, that you, when it comes to drawing trees, you draw trees a certain way, and then you changed your style of drawing uh, because of the impact of that. But then something's changed for you. What was it that really kind of changed your perspective of what that means? Yeah. So yeah, just to recap briefly. So, so my, you know, when I was young, I used to like to draw these really detailed trees. I draw every leaf, every branch. Mm -hmm. You can imagine a, a, a tree with dozens of leaves and I'd even draw the yeah. veins and leaves, all the detail. And I went to see how the other, you know, I went to school and I saw how the other children drew trees and it was this little, you know, two lines with a little poofy cloud mm -hmm. on top. Um, what happened yeah. is, is when I saw how the other children drew trees, I, I changed. I, uh, mm. I I started drawing them the way they did, not the way I used to. And my mom, yeah. when she saw this, she cried. She really cried. Mm. And and so, you know, after this, this, um, you know, after watching my mom die, mm -hmm. you know, how do you think I draw trees now? Yeah. And and the truth is, I draw them the way my mom would want me to draw them. I draw them the yeah. way I see them, the way I know that she, you know, she cared about me as my mom wanted me to draw them the way I see them. And so, you know, even just sharing this story with you uh, about being, you know, figuratively right now telling you about my mom, I'm, I'm drawing trees the way I see them. Yeah. That's um, amazing. And that just knowing that she wanted me to draw trees the way I see them, that, that affects me profoundly today. Mm -hmm. With that, with that influence of, you know, drawing trees the way she wants you. I mean, obviously that's, not only f literally you do that, figuratively you do that as well. With the impact that your mom had, the the way in which that has changed you and molded you, how in the bigger picture, how is that how does that affect you when it comes to being your unique self? How do you make sure you you are mindful of that and teach your kids that as well? Well, that's a great question. You know, our kids all come with uh just desires to do their own thing, you know. Um let, let me give you an example. I had my daughter come up to me and she said, Hey dad, I want to hike this mountain. <laughs> There's a mountain by our house. It's about 11,700 feet. Oh. Well, she was five years old at the time. And, I, oh. and you know, my first instinct was, you know, it's 11,700 feet. Uh, but she was very persistent. And she said, I really want to hike it with you, dad. I really want to hike it with you. And, uh, and so I, I kind of had a talk with her. I said, you know, if, if you really want to, I'll let you do it. Cause it was kind of like, this is what she wanted to do. I kind of like me wanting to draw trees in a way. I said, I want you to know it's going to be a 15 mile hike and we're going to go up thousands of feet. Your feet are probably going to hurt at some point. You okay with that? And she said, dad, I'm okay with it. Anyway, I decided to let her hike this 11,700 foot mountain that's near us. And it was surprising because she did it. I mean, she got wow. to the top and, and, and she had these people who were really avid, you know, hikers, you could tell they were serious and they were high fiving her and they were, that's you know, cool. when she got to the top, they actually gave her a standing ovation. She had like an audience oh, up there giving cute. her a standing ovation. And I think letting her kind of lead the way there where she was mm -hmm. saying, dad, I think I can do this. And even though there was a part of me that said, ah, you're only five to let her do it. 
you know, she, I think she's got a lot of confidence now. She's, she oh kind of has this idea that like, I can do this. And yeah, it was yeah. hard. Yeah. Her feet did hurt. I mean, they did. And she, yeah. you know, but, but it was a good experience for her. And so I think, you know, as parents, our job isn't to get in the way of our children and say, well, you can't do that. You're, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let you do that. I think our job is to say, you know what, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to do something that was unsafe, but, but within the parameters of, of reasonable being good parents to say, you know what, if you want to try it, let's do it. So yeah. great question. I think it's really interesting as well. I mean, it's, it's fantastic that you did that. I think it's interesting as well is we can all look back on times in our life and something that was really traumatic happened or something that we, that was very impactful in a negative way. But it's fantastic that you were able to give her this opportunity so she can look back and say, wow, I did this at when at this age. So I, like you said, that a confidence is instilled. So I think if, as parents or as just even mentors, whatever, whoever, whatever role you play, a person plays, is to be really mindful of the more of those positive, healthier um, actions and behaviors, that is going to be what they remember the most. And so unfortunately for every negative thing that happens, it takes six positive things to counteract that according to psychology. So <laughs> there's a lot right there, but the more you can do of those things, it can really help them say, wow, I did this, I did this, I did this. And to have those milestones to be able to just really draw on that confidence to say, I've overcome this. So there's, I can definitely overcome the thing perhaps that I'm, I'm facing right now that may be difficult for me. Yeah, exactly. And I, I love that you said six positive things. You know, I, I was reading this book. I have uh, my brother who really likes to talk about parenting and education. Mm -hmm. He uh, he recommended this book. I'll it's called the the Power of Positive Parenting by Glenn Latham, mm -hmm. and it basically says you know mm -hmm. the most effective way to shape human behavior is to basically catch uh, people doing something right. So you know mm -hmm. it, it, it's much more effective to say, "Hey, wow, great job! I really like the way you did that. Give attention for that." Then it is to say, "Hey, I can't believe you." And then, you know, you've ever seen a parent where the kid walks in and they say, you stayed up too late and you did get your bed made and you've gotten the C minus in math and, and they say all the negative things, but more effective would be to say, you know what, you know, I got to tell you, my, I had a daughter, she's a great daughter. I just got to give her props, but she was one of my oldest daughter came to our room one morning and she said, Hey dad, guess what? I got ready for bed. I'm, excuse me. She goes like, I got ready for school. I made my bed. I uh, made my lunch. I just wanted to surprise you. I'm ready for school. And I just learned wow. about this positive reinforcement not too long ago. And I went to my wife in the closet and I said, Hey, let's give this a lot of attention. Let's let's cause if you think about behaviors kind of like seeds and attention, like water. So let's give this a lot of attention. So I went out there and said, Hey, wow, your bed looks great. You did this and that. And it was really interesting because she did it again. <laughs> you know, she kept doing it for years. <laughs> she did it. She, she'd get up and make her bed, do all this stuff. And I think that I can see it really working. Less effective would have been for me to wait till she sleeps in, doesn't make her bed, and then storm in her room and say, yeah. can't believe you didn't make your bed. And how many times do I have to tell you? And I think if as parents, if we can start trying to catch our kids doing something right, our ability mm -hmm. to influence and, and kind of shape their behavior, we're using a much more effective way to do it. I 100% agree with that. Is even when it comes to positive psychology, positive psychology is essentially doing that. You focus on what's going really well, and the more you focus on that in your life, the more you look for those things. So, for example, if I say, "Tell me about your day," and some some people can say, "Oh, it's the worst day ever." Well, it wasn't the worst day ever. It was maybe five minutes of something you didn't like. But if you focus so much on that, unfortunately, that's what you see. You conceptualize your day as it was a bad day. So it's really important to parse those things out to basically say, okay, yeah, for these five minutes, it wasn't my favorite, but the rest of this is great. So let me look at the other areas of my life. And so it's so important to look for those things because when you can compartmentalize them, separate that, then one situation just is a situation. It's not, it doesn't define everything else as well. So to really look for those things to consciously stop. And sometimes I tell my, my patients, my listeners, go ahead and, and put a random uh, timer on your phone. Just say timer for 20 minutes. And all of a sudden the 20 minutes goes off. You're like, well, how do I feel? What's going on with me right now? When you can stop and have that moment of reflection, say, well, this, today's actually really good. Or this moment's really good. And so when you are able to create that stop and think, mm -hmm. to look at what's happening, it allows for a person to say, I'm doing pretty well. I'm really proud of that. And so the more you do that, the more you intentionally look for something that's going well. Oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to have to write that down. Thanks, James, for sharing that. <laughs> I want to transition into your book, uh, What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. Tell me more about that. Well, I think the real premise is just behind the book is because I really believe that what we do as parents is going to have more of effect than anything else we do. You know, we can yeah. go out and create big businesses and rockstar businesses and there's nothing wrong with creating a great business and doing well at work. But I feel like sometimes as we forget how long that influence is really going to last, you know, um, mm -hmm. 
let me, let me give you an example. I ask people this question. I say, do you know what your great, great grandparents did for a living? And when I ask that question, most people can't tell you. Now, occasionally I get somebody who says, well, he was a rancher or she was this or whatever. But um, most people, remember you had 16 of them. They don't know. Yeah. And yeah. so for those of for those of the listeners here who are parents, here's the bad news. <laughs> we'll, we'll focus on the good news. Um, the bad news is, is that your great great grandkids probably are going to care about as much about what you do for a living as, <laughs> as you care about what your great great grandparents did for of a course, living. They probably yeah. aren't going to care. Um, but you know, let me give you an, ex an obvious example. I li I live in America. Well, the reason I live in America is because somebody many. Uh, hundreds of years ago, got on a boat and came to America. Well, that one choice by an ancestor many, many centuries ago still affects me today. It affects my what the language I speak. It affects my culture. It affects uh, my educational opportunities. It affects my financial opportunities. All of that. And it, and that's a real obvious example because you can see it with geography. But there's sure. other things. I mean, were, were they patient? Were they kind? Were they keyed in? Were they checked out? Were they drunk? All those things can still filter down just as well as the geographical piece. That's so something to think about. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, that is important because every choice I make, you know, even meeting someone or marrying someone, that's a choice, which then begets the children and then the children then have their own children. So all those and everything from the major things, like you said, to the smallest things are important. So living, also just living a life more of an, with intention of saying, how is this, how could this potentially affect me? One thing I always think about is my, my goal is to be able to provide an inheritance for my children's children. And so be mindful of that and so that my choices that I make today influences that. So inheritance doesn't necessarily have to mean always financial, the financial aspect of it, which is a big part of it, but it also can be, I wanna create a life of peace, a life of joy. So it can be from these intangibles that we can't see, but if the environment that I, that I have in my life is conducive to, like I said, joy, to peace, to faith, whatever that might be, if I can continually demonstrate that and show that, then that's what I teach my children. And my children then, Hopefully, we'll be able to teach their children and it continues to move on in that way. As we know, children are so um, – from the ages of three to – or excuse me, infant to nine years old, that's when they learn the morality. And so they know what the right, what's right from wrong. They know what punishment. They know how to uh, – conformity. All that is something that's so important. So those first nine years are one of the most incredible times to really teach a child that because that is how they will understand their place in the world as well. I love that. Did you say the first nine years? Is that what you said? Correct. Yes. And so there, if yeah. all my viewers and listeners who want to learn more about this, there, Eric Erickson is a really famous uh, developmental psychologist. And he talks about all the different stages of, of stages of development. And so you'll find the different aspects of that. But up to nine years old is when you'll see how they kind of understand the place of the world. And then from the teenage years, that's their identity, et cetera. And it just keeps going up to later stages of life. But it's always really good. I always refer back to that because it's really interesting to know how to parent from a psychological approach as far as the stages of development per age. And when you know what that is, you're like, ah, oh, this is what my child's learning right now. Let me make sure that I help them with their initiative. Let me make sure I help them with their hope, with finding hope, with finding confidence, all those things as well. So it's, it's interesting to not only understand from a developmental psychology standpoint, but also just from a personality standpoint with their children too. So, so many great things that we're talking about today. So I definitely want my viewers and listeners to read your book because that is something I think is really important because everything you've experienced yourself obviously is has been incredibly impactful for you as well i wanted to ask you something jumping into the book though is it is it more of a is it a memoir is it a is a novel what kind of book is it per se? well it's it's more of a <laughs> it's more of advice that i want to give my kids now um some of that advice is just to be who you are you know what i mean to be authentic like my mom wanted me to be um mm -hmm. And, and it tells a little bit of the story, but also it, it tells some things that I think are really important. I really like what you said, though, about this, this first nine years being so informative. You know, there was someone who said something to this effect, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm quoting it wrong, but it, they said, you know, if we don't fix the dynamics that happen in families, everything else we do will be like straightening deck chairs on the Titanic. And I think mm -hmm. about that, you know, when we see, when we see problems in society, where we see major big you know, people who are doing, frankly, horrible things. The problem didn't start that year. It probably started yeah. way back when they were before nine years old, when, when they didn't have a parent who was checked in to say, you know what, and teach them about that initiative or that hope or that morality or the, the yeah. you know, that, that they needed to learn. And so really the, if you go to the source, even the study show, you know, a lot of the guys who are, there are people in, who are doing stuff in, you know, in prison, had parents mm -hmm. who weren't, weren't present. 
um, yeah. who had, you know, you and I, you know, they had, they had parents who weren't checked in. And then 20 years later, 30 years later, these huge problems come out, but the real root happened decades before. And so yeah. my book is to try to inspire parents to realize that they really do have the ultimate career and mm -hmm. that their influence yeah. When, when you, when you, when you're sitting there, you know, teaching your kids about initiative or hope or morality or what's, you know, how do we're going to treat people with respect when they're five and six, yeah. that, that lesson you teach them is going to go on for probably, I think hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, you, you, you don't realize you can't see it, but it's going to last longer. It's going to last a long time. And I, exactly. And I think that, yeah, exactly. And I think those, the smaller aspects of how to teach, cause there's so many different ways in which a parent can teach their child. It could be an obvious thing of sitting down and talking about this. One thing I always like to, to really instill with, with parents is there is what's called narrative therapy. So narrative therapy is essentially what we do in, in psychology. If I'm working with little kids, I will tell them a story. I can make up the story. So let's say I'm teaching a child about, or a child has come to me because he, t he tends to lie a lot. Okay. So a little <laughs> lies a lot. So I remember this one little boy in, in particular. And so I would tell them the story about this little frog and I would tell, you know, make up the story about the little frog who lied and all these things. And you, what you do is then you tell them, um, okay, so he, the little frog got caught with something. What do you think happened? And so um, then you let the child fill in the blank. And so they fill in the blank with what they think happens. So you kind of see how they think about it. But then you say, well, it, it, it could have happened, but this is actually what happens. So you teach them the lesson actually in the mm. story. So, so it's not like I'm talking to the little boy, but I'm talking about a frog who is lying. And the little boy can hear that. And so he is, he ascribes what he's feeling, what happened to that, the cause and effect with that. And then, so we would continue to talk about that frog in session. So the more you can uh, externalize the lesson and talk about something that's with your imagination, then all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, that's really cool. And then they learn it without having to actually be taught the lesson, an obvious lesson. Well, James, what, that's a, such a great idea. I need to write that yeah. down too. There, I'm going to have to make some notes on here. You're giving me some great ideas to be a good parent. Thank you for that. Things well, like this, you know. And, and see, James, you're in a really unique situation because you're able to help parents learn these skills. They may not come intuitively because they may not have learned it, sure. which can have a massive effect. So in a sense, your business and being able to teach others how to do things, um, wow, how valuable. Narrative therapy. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, I just – I've yeah, I can't say too much about it, but I was just interviewed for a, a big publication about that. And I was talking about the aspects of that and when it comes to, to really anything – you don't have to use a, a narrative therapy like in psychology that we would do, but that, that technique is so important to just simply use something like that to change the dynamic and the, and the children can learn. In fact, the funny thing is, is um, I remember my mom actually had done this for my, uh, I talked told my mom about this years ago she, for my, um, for my nieces and nephew. And so she would do that. And then my nieces and nephew now tell their kids the same type of story. So my mom would use it. So it's now been a generational thing where the little ones, and even my mom will still talk to her great grandchildren about things like that. So they have these little stories and they talk about how they learned right from wrong. And so it's, it's a really interesting way to, to come up with a, a random silly story and that it's still can be passed down from generation to generation as well. That's so interesting. And, and I've heard too, and I love that you're saying that I've heard too, that when you tell people a story, it, it, they remember it so much longer than if you just come up with some statistics or a, a PowerPoint oh, yeah. pre presentation. So using the stories where people can say, Oh yeah, I remember that story about the frog or I remember the story yeah. about whatever he talked about. What well, that seems well, so the interesting thing, Yeah. To, com to compound that as well, or to piggyback off that it's the, the reason why people remember those types of things is because you, you're using their five senses. So as I'm talking to you, you see me, you hear me. Um, and so if I'm holding the child, your sense of touch, so there's a lots of the more of your five senses you use, the more the child is present and grounded in the moment. And so not only do they have the external five senses, but then they imagine in their sense of sight, in their, in their mind, the creativity of that. And so you can even say, what did, what did the frog felt like? And they can describe what the frog felt like. And then um, you can either find something that's similar to that. So the more, more of your five senses you use when you're telling the story, when you're engaged, or just even parenting in general, the more the child's going to remember that. So it's much different than just speaking something, which is just your sense of hearing. But the more, like I said, the more of the five senses you use, the more it crystallizes in their brain what, what the lesson is. And that's how they'll understand and remember it much more succinctly. What a great thing for parents to know. Man, Jake, thanks for sharing that. I want to be a better parent. No, so I love talking about this. This is, this, is, great. <laughs> no, this is what I love talking about. These types of things. <laughs> what do you think yeah. uh, overall, you know, when you look at your own life and what, what you're teaching your kids, what do you think is the most impactful lesson that you can that you've taught them so far. Totally putting in a spire. Oh goodness. The most impactful. That's a good question. 
Because sometimes we think it's yeah. obvious, and then later on, we were like, wait a minute, <laughs> you missed the lesson. I was like, well, <laughs> it's kind of I, funny. I, you know, I don't know if this is the most impactful, but it's the one that came to mind when you said it. So I'll, okay. I'll say it. Um, I want my kids to be able to, to, to do hard things. And I want to be able to unleash that ability to do hard things. And and I want my kids to be able to, to look at life with a, a positive outlook. And so, um, you know, I blow, I sometimes, I, you know, as parents, we make mistakes and we, we wish sometimes we no, would do certain things. And sometimes we, sometimes we do things that are, that are right, but just being able to, I'll tell you one more story kind of along the lines of my, um, of the same one where I had a, it was December last year and my my kids said hey dad can we sleep outside and it was that same kind of thought about the mountain right that my kids said i want to sleep outside and i i could have said well it's freezing outside because i live in yeah. in in utah near the mountains and it's it goes okay. 20 degrees outside oh but i just i decided i thought you know here's here's my kids they're expressing this desire they're wanting to do something and i can either quash it real quick and say well you, you can never mm-hmm. sleep outside it's too much but i said you know what if, if you want to try it we've got some really good mummy bags if we give you two mummy bags and we and you wear some thermals and a good hat and you make sure you don't get wet while you're out there, let's go set up a tent and I'll help you. And so we did that. And it was a great time. You know, we slept out in the tent in the backyard and the kids now they have that confidence knowing that, you know what, mm-hmm. I can sleep out in 20 degree weather. I just have to make sure I have the right gear <laughs> and don't get wet. And, we, and we, you know, we talk through the things, but allowing your kids to express who they want to be and also you know, helping them within a safe parameter to do that. I'm not going to go send them out to sleep in 20 degree weather without, of course, you know, helping them to do it safely, yeah, but, of course. but allowing them to say, I can do these, these safe, but, but kind of difficult things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's important. I, I, yeah. Um, once again, of course I, I agree with you. It is important because you, when you set about the safe parameters, it's the older a child gets, the more you parent them differently. So as a little kid, or when they're little, 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 they don't really have what, options you go clean your room or whatever it might be but then when you have when they get a little bit older to teach them autonomy or how to make decisions you actually you can give them three options and you're fine with all three of them mm. so and what when you give them the three options and they're like oh, okay yeah that's i get to choose out of those three but it's still within the parameters of what you the parent will tell them so it's still their way of learning how what makes sense for them giving them more autonomy within the parameters and confines of what a parent says is healthy for them. So it's, it's really good to know. And unfortunately I know some parents yeah, are working with some parents who don't, who don't, whose parenting style doesn't develop as a child develops. So often they will have the same type of parenting style that they did when the child was maybe 10 versus mm-hmm. when the child's 16. So you obviously, as you, the child ages, the developmental stages versus the parenting style should also develop evolve as well. Because without that, unfortunately, that's where we find a lot of rebellion. You'll find a lot of individuals who just don't allow, aren't able to find their autonomy or their individuality. And so that's where respectfully, sometimes parents forget and they don't develop their parenting style as well as, as with it. That's equal to the, the child's age. That's, all, that's awesome. Do you, do you have any resources on that? I'm curious about making sure that you parent at their, uh, Oh, I, well, I really I, like, I I really like that thought. <laughs> yeah, really like these that are, thought. These I'm are making notes, James, of everything you're telling me here because I want to be a good dad. So no, you for, are. That's, I mean, that's why I want you on my show because you've done so many great things. <laughs> now, that's just something you can just uh, you can Google as well. So um, I, I have a lot of things that I've written about these types of things. But yeah, if you want to go to my website, jamesbellatlifeology.com, I can link you with some of those things as well. But enough about me because this is more about you. I want you uh, to focus more on your book one more time. So your book, What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. If my viewers and listeners want to find more information about that, to purchase this book, I highly endorse it. Where will they find all this information online? Well, if they want to look me up, I have a funny first name. You spell it E-K-S as in Sam, A-Y-N as in Nancy. It, it, it's really a, a very unique name. If you, and it's xane.com. So you spell it E-K-S-A-Y-N.com. Um, you could, you can buy my book on Amazon. Um, and again, it's just trying to, sh- to, to show my personal view of how I want to raise my kids, but to, but to just be the, the point is to be kid in that what you do as a parent's really going to have a huge effect and it's the ultimate career. Yes, it certainly is. Thank you so much for a fantastic guest on my show today. My viewers and listeners also know that if they can't find this information any other place, simply go to the show notes at jamesmillerlifeology.com and I will link you with Xane as well as purchase his book one more time, What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. Thanks, Xane. We'll talk soon.